Hello and good afternoon again. It is a pleasure to facilitate this panel. The afternoon panel in which we will try to focus on this shared struggles for inclusion this morning. One of the speakers said that she hadn't found sources in Catalonia. And there are sources, but of course we need to recover them because they are of very high interest. So let me start by introducing the members of the panel. We want to speak about the past, the present and the future. And we'll take four perspectives the education perspective, the work perspective, the independent life perspective, and the last one will be leisure and politics. So, to lay on the table these topics, we have the perfect panelists. Maite Ruiz, she is the president of the Organization for the Defense of the Rights of People with Mental Disabilities, an entity which was founded years ago, inspired by the American Association for the Rights of Human Rights. So this would be the key idea, the central idea. This organization inspires us to, you know, organize this debate. She has worked for more than 35 years in the field of people with disabilities. He, she has led different services such as a phone hotline for people with disabilities and she is an activist in different organizations i've met her in different circumstances we have partnered in the measure process between different entities it's always a pleasure to work with her then josep josep ruth Wow, we worked together for 15 years, such a long time. I'm a little bit emotional now. 15 years exploring, getting to know things, mm, failing dramatically, but moving forward little by little. He is a technical director of the Down Syndrome organization in Spain. He is the coordinator of the Town Spain Independent Life Unit, and he is a member of the Latin American entity on Down Syndrome. He is a lecturer at the UB and at the UOC. Josep designed and organized residential services, which back then were groundbreaking because even people with more severe disabilities were invited to live independently. Then Sergi Montorell from Tarragona, remember when you used to call me, how do I get all the way up here? He is a person with mental disabilities, living with mental disabilities. He is a member of the board of LAT and INCAT, where he is also a representative. He is from Bals and he is a civil servant in the Ministry of the Economy. So let's get started. I would like to focus first on education. Let me give you a hint which is not going to be an easy task, because sometimes one would say we are like in a hamster wheel. I have a slide here that represents where we come from and where we stand today. In an attempt to see what happened in year 1800. Back in 1800, the room, the salon, the same room from the city council was used for a priest to teach people on literacy. In 1857, the first bill on public education was adopted. 
referring to the concept of a special education. In 1824 and 1843, the first schools for blind and deaf pupils were created. In 1910, the Sombox partnership was created, and in 1921, the first special education school called Villa Joana was created in Balvidrera. So this was the first ever specialized school here in Barcelona. In 1955, the first bill on education was adopted. In 1940, 1970, sorry, the first bill on the legitimacy uh, on the existence of a parallel system was adopted back in 1970, the bill, the education bill of 1970. So let me rewind back in the 19th century, century sorry, and before what happened with people with mental disabilities. Let me underline that this panel will focus on people with mental disabilities, living with mental disabilities. This morning, we've heard a colleague living with physical disabilities. Well, she's not here anymore, but just to say that we are focusing on this topic. What did, what did we have back then? We had... Uh, psychiatric hospitals, charities, hospitals, and that was about it. And the aim of these organizations was to keep them alive. They used to say, oh, they can even hurt, they hurt themselves because, you know, we better keep them apart because they can, they're dangerous. Let's lock them down at home. I remember the colleague who spoke this morning saying that these people were locked up at home of course they would fall on the floor there were no wheelchairs back then or they were not generalized remember they would move uh, you know some people invented a kind of wheelchair but mobility was extremely difficult so the first half of the 20th century um, meant the start of medical models, social determinism, psychological models that somehow marked concepts which have been extremely painful, such as the intellectual intelligence, the Gauss curve tells us that if you're here, you're normal, and if you are in the extremes, you can be extraordinary or infra normal. And this is not a big name, this is just the logic of the Gauss curve. So being subnormal back then was not considered negative. The problem is that then all these concepts are used in a negative way. So on the grounds of this model, we started gaining a certain degree of specialization with experts in the field, etc. For example, in the Netherlands and down this line, they started classifying on the grounds of certain categories and they even came up with 17 different kinds of schools. 17. And the logic behind was straightforward. The logic was, okay, if I get specialized in this specific area of disabilities are be the best, right? Of course, they soon realized that there, were, there was no scientific evidence on the topic and they had to step back and look for heterogeneity. During the 60s and the 70s, there was an historical turning point. 1962 was a historical turning point when the Kennedy's panel president was set up, Kennedy realized that in the US there were thousands and thousands of people with, living with disabilities locked down in horrible conditions in care homes. And then the panel president was set up, translating into the first bill on integration dating from 1975 the bill on the integration of people living with disabilities. So let me now go back to Catalonia, 1960, 1970, things started moving forward little by little, some 
organizations were created. And there is another element, which is the War Rope Report. In 1968, a lady, Margaret Thatcher, who was the Secretary of the State of the United Kingdom, decided that at least 20% of students had special education needs. Magic word. Special needs, 20%. And from there on, parallel systems were set up in 1981 in Catalonia. The technical criteria were adopted under the leadership of several experts. And during the 80s and the 90s, new, more education-oriented model uh, were created, the WHO created the concept disability in 1980, and Josep rem reminded us on the first bill for the integration approved by Trias Fargas. So integration bills were adopted, and in 1984, and I will stop for a second here, the first regulation of education was adopted in Catalonia. It was a quite groundbreaking piece of legislation which considered that the education system was not a subsystem of the ordinary system and it had to become a, an extra line at the disposal of the several education levels. Ordinary, again, I insist a great deal on this concept, ordinary. 1984, so 40 years ago. We used to say, well, special education has nothing to do with special schools, but rather with special resources to be invested into regular schools. So events unfolded. The LOXI was adopted in 1990 with the setting up of different elements such as PDIs, APIs, etc. And in 1997, the first royal decree on special education was passed, allowing the interaction between special schools and regular schools. So one could knock at the door of regular schools to set up specialized infrastructures. In the 21st century, we went from a concept oriented to special needs to pedagogical support, to a logic of pedagogical support. And in Catalonia, a new royal decree was adopted with the support of the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, adopted in 1996, the Salamanca Conference, the WHO regulations, etc. And I will close by saying that all this converged into the construction of what we call today a school for all. So the problem is that on the grounds of the new social model that the colleagues mentioned in the morning, this is a human rights based model, not a psychological model, but a human rights based model where all citizens are entitled to have their human rights respected also at the education sector. I would like to conclude by referring to a concept which is important. The school for all, we all wish, should be based on robust pedagogical evidence. School should be for all without any form of exclusion. And of course, it should be a forum for interaction and not only for learning. And a special education schools should be transformed into resources center. There are interesting examples at home and abroad about these resource centers or reference centers. And it's not me who consider so, but the UN Convention, the last report published by the follow-up committee on the situation of the school system in Catalonia and Spain, well, according to the report, there is a lot of work ahead. And the first measure to be undertaken is to break the silos between specialized schools and 
regular schools. And now I would like to hand it over to Marta Ruiz, Maite Ruiz. She will be referring to the world of labor. <clears throat> Thank you, and I would like to add regarding my person that I am the mother of a person living with disabilities who is 42 years old, and as a mother, of course, we have undergone a long process since the 80s up to date, so oftentimes I have mixed feelings, and I don't know if I'm acting as a mother or as a professional, so I do not really agree with Ferran's remarks. I've felt name and shame about being overprotective or being biased. To be honest, I believe that it's been thanks to the families that today we stand where we stand. The strength of families has been mm, central to push forward important projects, important initiatives, which perhaps failed in terms of collaboration or partnering with professionals, but there is no doubt that we need to pay tribute to families. It was a joint effort. I would like to thank you for having invited me to tell you a little bit more about LAC. Let me start by saying that the LAT, the LAT is an entity where should I click? This is not going anywhere. Oh, no. So LA Team is an organization that was created in 2015 by a group of families and professionals. We realized that the UN Convention clearly describes the rights of people living with disabilities, but in real life, all these rights are undermined and violated on a daily basis. So we believe that our children, our sons living with people, living with disabilities, with mental disabilities, not with physical disabilities, but with mental or intellectual disabilities as well, it's them, right? We support them, but someone must represent them. And this is why we believe it timely to set up an organization. We decided to adopt a, the legal entity of an organization. We are a human rights organization composed by volunteers. Why do we exist as an organization? Well, because families believe that we are the natural support of our descendants, not because we want to replace professionals, but because we want to partner with them. We want to be part of the decision-making processes and the legislative processes that affect people living with mental disabilities. At the same time, we believe Well, at the beginning, we set up a list of objectives. What do we think has to be done to obtain such rights? Well, first of all, awareness raising will be key. And how can we get there? Well, through communication, through accessibility. And only when we are visible in society, Will be, we, will we be capable of claiming our rights? We also believe that a key role of ours is to act as a whistleblower. As you have seen, there's very little of us, very few of us, and with very good will. There is the entire debate on the secondary education certification, which is a violated right. 
for many people living with mental disabilities. We lobby before the education department and the Catalan parliament on what we believe our children should be entitled to, right? After spending years in the academic uh, sector. Another aim is to ensure residential co-payment to end it. We believe it to be unfair. We believe our the rights of our children are violated because we are undertaking actions for them not to have to pay such high fees, which are against their rights. We do not agree with the disability assessments. We know that things are becoming more and more complicated. There's the transparency law. We have to call on the Department of Social Rights. We are now engaging with a mediation service. So again, it is a permanent struggle to obtain indispensable rights. And we believe it depends on us because it's not the role of social entities at the role of families. We also partner with other organizations. Now we are part of the independent life movement with whom we are working on the personal budget. We are working also on the the institutionalization of people living with mental disabilities, which would contribute enormously to independent life. And we also network between families. The satisfaction when we, we organize this family with 270 members, which pushes us forward when confronted with a major challenge. When we can't find a psychologist, we can ask our network, do you know anyone who is expert in behavior conditions? So of course, we need experts, experts in very specific fields for our children. We want training and different kinds of trainings amongst us. Of course, there is a significant network to ask the public administration to set up an office for us. One of our aims is to ensure the presence of different experts so that when we are confronted with problems in different fields, well, it is important to know how to overcome it, what resources are available who is the expert in each field, be it the public administration or private entities. I could spend hours claiming for more things, but let me focus on the topic I've been asked to raise today. In real life, and while discussing with a friend, he told me, well, provide a certain historical background. Mm, difficult today, right? Because since this morning, a lot has been said on memorials, and then there's been the screening of Iran's documentary, which is extremely illustrative. So the historical background has already been set up. But perhaps I would add that people with mental disabilities have been left behind, silenced until the end of the 18th century. What else? In Spain, during the 60s, some organizations were set up, as we've seen in the documentary, for people living with mental disabilities. So the doctors, the families, the educators were the ones who found the context to uh, attend people living with handicap. In 1975, the General Assembly proclaimed the rights of people with disabilities, living with disabilities. At the beginning, mm, they were entitled rights, but there were no compliance mechanisms. And now, moving into the topic I've been asked to raise, in 1982, the LISB was adopted, regulating the 
regulating, for example, the fact that there had to be quotas in favor of people living with disabilities. This was back in 1982, but it hasn't been complied with. Many companies do not offer these services, and there is no way to, I mean, I could not insist enough on the importance of ensuring the inclusion of people living with mental disabilities into the community. In parallel, we started working with support, a methodology according to which people living with handicap have many more capacities than one would one think, and that they could access the labor market of normal companies. Let me tell you a little bit more. Let me give you a hint about a report and also about the characteristics of this kind of work and the presentations that we came up in back then. And in 1985, the Special Employment Centers um, law was um, approved, and I could go on and on, but I won't uh, carry on talking about laws. In 2006, the UN Convention was approved, and it's been mentioned several times. We went from an assistential medical approach to understanding that the barriers had to be suppressed, eliminated, and that community had to defend the rights of uh, persons with disability. And Article 17 says that people with disabilities should be able to work on an equal foot compared to other people, and they should have the opportunity to earn their life by choosing the job they want to do. We haven't reached that situation, unfortunately, yet. In 2018 or 2019, and the data are quite similar to current day data, what we have concerning uh, job access for people with disability is either to work at a special employment center or what we call work with support. The characteristics are different. At a special employment center, they should have 70% of the staff with disabilities. As a company, they had 100% social security tax reduction, in, if it's a special employment center, and 50% of the minimum wage is subsidized. And they also have a bonus of support for the person and here the company has the support of an association or a person they also the, the this work with support has also 100% of socially security tax reduction but uh, unlike the special employment uh, center it's a program it's not a service and what's the implication in the program today exists tomorrow might not exist sometimes it's something temporary and the problem is that uh, people with intellectual disability need support throughout their life and this way of working if it's a program working for a few months and then stopping it's difficult when we talk about these special employment centers, um, I think personally that really help people um, when it comes to work. Um, in the old times, um, it was easy to access this special employment uh, center. And this service at the beginning was a sort of transition towards um, working in a regular company, but it's not like that right now because uh, young people with uh, intellectual disabilities stay in these special employment centers. 
the may sometimes the company um, cannot uh, hire more people and sometimes the hurdle are the families also because we think that our children are in a protected environment in these special employment centers where they earn money and they can stay there so the family does not choose to send um, their children to a regular, ordinary company. This work with support is based in three pillars. On the one hand, we have companies, then people with disabilities and their families that as you were seeing in the documentary, families have an important role because these uh, uh, persons with disabilities uh, give the money very often to the families, so it's difficult for the families to give them autonomies. And then we have these uh, special uh, employment centers. We carry out a study, a survey, and we saw that if we wanted to be in line with the convention, well, we had to explore the path of this work with support or supported work. And we have to put pressure on the authorities so the authorities um, gave some stability to this work with support, invest in those programs so they continue and the person with disabilities could carry on working. And I'm going to speed up a little bit because a friend is looking at me. Uh, the, this study research survey we did uh, was carried out in 2019, but we have 80% of people with disability unemployed. The minimum wage of people without disability is 22,900. People with the uh, intellectual disabilities is uh, a little bit more than 1,100, um, 11,000, sorry, per year, and um, they are really the last ones. Fear was an important element that we saw in our study. Fear, the company's fear, hiring people with intellectual disabilities, and the families also fear their children going um, to work in companies. And support is another important element. Without support, our children couldn't have an independent life, be part of the community, work, access to leisure activity, and many other things. So we have to carry out a good assessment so our children receive the adequate support. Talking about elements that can foster labor inclusion, I would like to outline three. On the one hand, companies, companies should know better the group of uh, people with disabilities. I think that we haven't progressed much in the last 40 years. We need to train also and support. We need to support the person and the company too, who wants to hire a person with disabilities. We made three proposals. The support must be personalized and flexible, because right now the supports are not personalized, they are not flexible. The support has to be given to people who really need and an assessment has to be carried out. A second proposal was, and sorry, I would like to add something important. It has to be a two direction a path. If uh, someone has been, uh, goes out of a uh, special employment center, if the person leaves that center, it has to wait one year to go back and work in that same uh, special employment center. So we have to change that. Second proposal, people with disability have to work with support and we have to talk to the companies and foster and subsidize new uh, inclusion um, job places, public and private. Uh, 
fet el 3. And we have to um, check the role of these uh, special employment centers because if it was, uh, if these centers were set up as a tradition to the companies, it should be like that. And then we thought what we would like for 2030, we would like to have improved the access to paid work in regular environments, uh, company, that companies have normalized hiring uh, people with disability and that individuals with uh, intellectual disabilities feel fulfilled, comfortable and motivated in these settings. Thank you very much. the article and we apologize but I think the person speaking is not using the microphone. I think that you have presented article 27 of the convention uh, which was very useful and now Giuseppe is going to talk about the article 19 of the convention. Good, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having invited us. Uh, and thank you to a friend who was a person who called me. And it's thanks to him that I'm here. And having said that, I'm going to start with my presentation. Can you hear me better now? I will try not to repeat things that have been mentioned this morning. Uh, and I think that maybe this afternoon we're repeating some of the things that have been mentioned this morning and after watching the documentary. Wow, I have to say, except the, for the glasses and the cars, the rest, I think, had not changed in decades. And Maite, I was asked to provide a little bit of historical context, so I'm going to talk about the independency law in Catalonia, and I'm going to focus on the Down Collective, Down Syndrome Collective. And we know that each disability means different opportunities, different restrictions, so it's very difficult to talk in a general way. And this is gonna, what I'm going to try to talk. Okay, if we talk about independent life. Uh... Throughout history, throughout centuries, what we've done and the models in which society has based disability have been, evolved, have been evolving. It started with um, not giving value, not giving a human value to these people. Uh, and even today, we have the dilemma of the uh, pre-birth uh, natal test or the right to abortion compare to um, when there is a, a problem detected during pregnancy and that creates an ethical dilemma. We, we had this approach or not giving value to these people and then we had mechanisms of uh, related to public life. Uh, these people were considered people that uh, were an obstacle in um, participation uh, spaces. Now we talk about, uh, we hear that um, hostile architecture in order to avoid uh, homeless people staying in the street. So we still have a little bit this approach. Uh, so this hygienist intention uh, led to the creation of institutions that had a uh, a first goal of reclusion, of uh, um, putting these people there to liberate us. And then with Christianism, um, well, uh, there was this idea that we have to give these people basic needs because uh, then 
the medicine came along, sophisticated uh, the hospitals. I'm talking about the 18th century. And charity and medicalization, what they did it was to build technical arguments to put the basis for the existence of institutions. Um, educational inclusion, but today still we are still talking about whether we want ordinary schools or a special schools, and we have uh, people still thinking that the best thing is to have these special needs schools. Um, so in the 60s, and I'm going to go back, then hippies came along in the 60s, social movements in the 60s, uh, May 68, then Vietnam War. The, the independent living movement was born. It's the first reference we have for independent living for people with disability. And many uh, organizations with uh, which I have worked um, dismissed this movement when it arrived in uh, Spain. I have been in contact with many organizations that thought, no, these people are not our people. And these movements allow the development of the social uh, model. And what Farran was telling us about, so the focus is not the person and uh, his or her disabilities and a special treatment, but that we have an environmental factor integrated and that the environment, and this is us and our participation spaces are not prepared and adapt to guarantee the um, same opportunity situation for these people. This happened in the 60s and 70s here. We had, we had Kippies like Ferran and a friend that uh, were going against the tide. Here we had a dictatorship, so we lagged behind, and we've been trying to recover. We had also the principle of normalization and integration that uh, was created, and uh, we are still talking whether these people should have different uh, conditions because they have certain disabilities. And this independent living uh, model or principle, which is important for me, this coincides with the UN Convention that give legitimacy, legitimacy to the social model of disability and make it uh, progress and show that uh, the rights for these people were not uh, fulfilled or respected. Consequences. And Maite, I don't know if you will like to hear that. What were the consequences? For decades, until the last, the, the last century, these people were put in institution, and this institutionalization still lasts. These people are negated, are not visible as subjects, as citizens. We, they were seen as a, an appendage of their families, and the families had to look after these people. They had to supervise them. So they belong to the family, but they were invisible for the rest. And that's a sort of institutionalization, too. They were considered that they belong to the family, so they were not considered as individuals or as human beings, and they had to be part of this family. That was it. And the other institutionalization is the more classical one. The only alternative were the, going to the institutions that would replace the family.
and the supervision of the family. And the society here in the middle had no responsibility, so exclusion was allowed, segregation was allowed, and society didn't have to change to include these uh, people. Uh, as we saw in the documentary, when uh, people were asked if these people uh, could work. I'm not, I'm going to keep it short. In Spain, we have a constitution that acknowledges the idea of disabilities, not people with disabilities, but disabilities. It has changed this year, only this year. This is the big contribution of the main two political parties this year was uh, the uh, idea of agreeing on now talking about people with disabilities. Thanks to this list, me, uh, law, things could change a little bit and created a service that was oriented towards the special attention and didn't take into account the integration approach. So the idea was to cater for a special need instead of preserving the integration of uh, people, persons with disabilities. <laughs> And in the meantime, our society didn't have to think about universal access, um, or accessibility, physical, sensory, and I would like to add a cognitive, uh, which is maybe less known, uh, clear communication, pictograms, drawings, there are several platforms and movements that identify segregation and discrimination attitudes towards people with disabilities as barriers that allow the continuation of this segregation. And here I'm coming to my experience. I wasn't a hippie, and in the 80s, my experience, I had experience in different services, but mainly residential services. And working in a nursing home uh, for people that needed a high level of support, that, and these people were condemned to be in nursing homes or institutions. Well, I was working in one nursing home and had the idea to design a small unit of uh, coexistence, six to seven people in the city, in apartments, in where other people live, in the same building. There was a certain personalization of support of the support provided, and we use all the support at our disposal, at our hand, uh, with volunteers too, so the person with disabilities could uh, um, could um, access to different services and that could lead a normal life. But I wanted to sometimes break the regulations because here we have the authorities that um, authorizes all these um, subsidies, but sometimes we have to break a little bit the law to go beyond. In 2000, a friend asked me, and it's very important, asked me, 
to attend a seminar on a new way of housing and support. I went with a couple of colleagues, and Jay Clay, an American, was presenting an experience done in the 90s, and Ronald Reagan, a conservative, an economical crisis um, after the boom of Wall Street and big uh, institutions were dismantled, and institutions in the U.S. have to develop research programs to find new models, and they came up with models in which we inspired in the foundation I was working. And it was a model dissociation the access to housing to guarantee that people with disabilities could access uh, housing and have of uh, agencies that could provide these personal support services. We copied the American model here in Catalonia in 2000. We did a pilot project. We didn't go into real estate. We had some authorities that we thought would include uh, people with disability in these housing policies, but that has not happened, but we can focus, focus on a model to provide um, personal assistance. It wasn't called like that because in 2000 we didn't talk about personal assistance, but if you read the design, it was personalized support with a personal budget. Uh, we were paying a st the person directly, all kind of disabilities, regardless of the degree of support and with the community integration. It's not the, it wasn't the idea of uh, having only a house or an apartment, but it was also to participate in the community. In 2002, the Catalan government um, uh, put in place a program to support the autonomy uh, in uh, the household. And more than 1,500 uh, people with disabilities and mental health problems can live independently at home. And it was also thanks to the Catalan government that included this new um, subsidy or new, new help. But we have still more people living in institutions or with the families, and many of them older than 40 years, and they are aging quickly. And the family institutionalization continues to be a reality. So there were some limits uh, by age in order to have access to these services, housing services and uh, personalized services, who you can live with and not. So there were restrictions and regulations. So, in a way, this subsidy, this grant, was uh, institutionalized in a way, heavily regulated. Not all people with disabilities in Catalonia can have access to this grant, to this uh, help. 24 years ago, I started helping people to look for an apartment in Barcelona for 500 uh, euros per month, and now it, I cannot even get them a, a, a room in a, an apartment for 500 euros. We've heard of other experiences concerning independent living here in Catalonia. We have an office of independent living in Barcelona set up in 2006 in order to provide an answer for people with a physical and sensory disability. Three years ago, we created the personal assistant model by the Barcelona City Council, including all sorts of disabilities, but it has a very long waiting list and it the needs the help of the Catalan government. There have been some uh, pilot projects of uh, um, apartments um, for um, deaf and blind people so they can live independently. Um, there have been also uh, bridge apartments for people uh, who go from an institution to independent living. 
in Al Bargada region, a personalized service was created for people with um, intellectual disability. The independent living movement has started in Al Garraf uh, region, and uh, some assemblies also have been uh, created, and we hear the voice of these people with disabilities. And concerning something Farhan and Maite were saying, there are initiatives about participation in civic life and participation in authorities and associations. The associations that manage the vast majority of services provided to these to persons with disabilities, and um, we're talking here about parents and professionals. And the idea is that these organizations or associations uh, um, should be run or managed by persons with disabilities. So these persons with disabilities could create assemblies and can access to the managing boards of these associations so they can decide and make the decisions. Um, we have, and uh, I will keep it short, things are happening in Catalonia, and these things should uh, promote independent living in Catalonia. But I'm rather skeptical. However, service portfolio portfolios are being assessed, uh, new services that are not part of the portfolio are being assessed to be introduced, new helps. The, some all laws or regulations are being reassessed. However, some legal changes that have taken place uh, recently are not known yet by uh, some persons with the disabilities. So we need to have better communication. Personal assistance is assistance is one of the main things because this deinstitutionalization will only be possible if we have this personal assistance or support so people can live in independently. And I'm not going to add anything else, because otherwise I'm going to be told off. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Joseph. <laughs> And now we're going to hand it over to Serge, who will tell us more about Articles 20 and 30 of the Convention, and that is Participation to Political Life and Leisure. Thank you. Serge, the floor is yours. The microphone is just impossible. Good afternoon. My name is Serge Bonquin, and now referring to Article 20 on the participation of political life, I have uh, had an active role in political life. I have been in Selva del Camp City Council and in the national parliament, there's very few of us, people living with disabilities, who have an active role in political parties. I believe there should be more of us representing people living with disabilities, because unless we are there, they're not going to come look for us. Four days ago, we managed to again it has been and what has been said about the convention 
aquest noi l'Ivan, em dius que ha posat intel·lectual, que ha estat una mesa electoral, que és el que també és important. More and more people living with disabilities believe and embrace politics. When I was at the Salvador Camp City Council, I believe I contributed to important steps forward. People living with disabilities, the elderly, sometimes have difficulties in understanding political manifestos. So it's interesting to introduce, for example, easy reading applications. I would also like to say that in the last elections, the European elections, the political party that I am part of gave me a great deal of visibility during the political campaign, and I believe this to be relevant. Those of us who are activists need to give further support to the voiceless. I would also like to say that if a national minister is a doctor or why a person living with disabilities cannot be the advisor for social rights, right? Because we are the best suited to speak about disabilities. Once in the Catalan Parliament, I was invited to the Commission on Disabilities. There's one in the Senate, another one in the Parliament, but it's not chaired by a person living with a mental disability, which is difficult to understand, right? Because we are the ones who are in a better position to speak about our reality. Like the colleague with limited mobility, she knows perfectly when a road is well adapted or not. So we are the best suited ones to speak about our concerns and our problems and the challenges we face, right? So we need to be in the decision-making loop. I would also like to say that the Catalan public service should provide further opportunities for people living with disabilities. This is a way to ensure, for example, I am a civil servant, and I must say that the Spanish competitive examination is much better adapted than the Catalan one, so perhaps more should be done down this line. I would also like to say that when a person is in a political party, of course, political parties have to adapt to the reality of people living with handicap, with disabilities. For example, the, my political party in Tarragona has adapted to me. They understand a great deal about disabilities and about the challenges we face. Now regarding leisure, people living with disabilities also have the right to have an active role in culture. Sometimes they infantilize us, of course, sometimes we need an adapted explanation but not as if we were babies. For example, the Tarragona Museum is adapted to Braille. And there is, for example, a clip that tells you or explains the pictures is extremely important. Well, the Tarragona Museum is rather tiny, but it's very well adapted. It's extremely accessible. I visited the museum a few days ago, and it's amazing.
Sometimes it's like if culture is not accessible to us, right? And we have the right to be active culturally. The interpreters apologize, the sound is breaking all the time, it's really difficult to follow. Not to speak about sports, the sports have to adapt to people living with disabilities, this is extremely important. People living with disabilities must have the opportunity to be active in all areas of life and in all sports and disciplines. For example, when it comes to swimming, well, it's easy to adapt swimming pools to many living with physical disabilities. I used to swim. And it was an adventure. I loved it. Standing the day out. <laughs> we don't need to compete because it's very difficult, right, for us to win medals. Not to speak about the Boy Scouts organizations. Boy Scouts organizations have to be adapted to people living with disabilities and not the other way around. It's not us having to adapt. It's important for Boy Scouts entities to ensure adaptability to people living with disabilities. The facilities, that is have to be adapted, everything has to be adapted. Now, speaking about political participation, once I had an interview with the former president of the Catalan parliament, and I told her, listen, if you want us to be active politically, you have to ensure that politics leaves room for our participation, for our active participation. It's very nice to say, oh, yeah, well, we welcome everyone into politics, but for that to be a reality, the political landscape has to be more adapted. For example, when I was the representative of the city council, the first time that I was part of the political list, of course, I don't want to. I don't want to be elected, to be honest. I just want to represent people living with disabilities. I don't want to be a first liner. And it was a beautiful experience. Again, it was a beautiful experience. So we need to ensure there's more and more political participation amongst people living with disabilities. Political manifestos have to be adapted in an easy reading logic. I think there is a political representative living with disabilities in Valencia. Political parties have to embrace our political participation. In the European elections, it was only me. 
jo sàpiga. I es va fer aquest programa perquè es fes inclusió i tal. Hem de ser més. Hem de donar a la gent que faci crítiques, faci flaix, i que la gent pugui donar aquesta visibilitat. Promote political participation amongst people living with disabilities. Now to conclude, I would like to say that libraries and cinemas would have to be adapted. When I go to the cinema, I'm deaf. I can't hear anything. Because there's a lot of people, there's noise. There's the mechanisms to adapt cinemas to people living with disabilities. Also, easy think techniques should be applied in libraries because not all of us are capable of understanding certain works hosted in libraries, so we have to ensure the participation of people living with disabilities in libraries. There should be more of us present in libraries. Sometimes I go to the library in Tarragona, um, I'm the only person living with disabilities attending that library. There's a lack of orientation of libraries towards people living with mental disabilities and well um, I'm going to leave it here thank you very much this is me Thank you very much to the members of the panel. If I'm not mistaken, we have like, what, 15 minutes for the Q&A. Let me act as an icebreaker. We have to be optimistic. I would like to focus now on the debate on whether I mean, children are rights holders and not families. It's a difficult debate, I know, but it has to be, it has to be raised because if children, since a very early age, they coexist with the rest of society thinks will be easier. There's an image, a recent image. Good afternoon. Might I agree with you? Per una vegada. No, amb el tema que la persona que té una discapacitat doncs té que portar la motxilla dels diners amb ella i no en funció de quin centre hi vagi, no? Sobretot perquè les persones que estan fent... ...who are working in the support field... ...són més cars que vagi a treballar... ...of course, they're expensive. ...perquè, clar, el comido per lo servido, no? And this doesn't make any sense. And that's why it's important to understand. Josep, you are right. If the 
If the CAT says that this person is, is all that, well, there's a clear lack of access to support and the enrollment is extremely high, so there is no entitlement to support mechanisms. So we are in a negative loop, right? We're not in a loop. So there is this incredible contradiction between what we want and what the regulation stipulates. Hello, I'm not going to get into the debate. I would like to say that I've been in the field for more than 35 years, and it's been amazing listening to you. I agree with the big picture that you've shared. A lot has been achieved, but there is a long way ahead. The situation today probably is not the best possible one. We would wish another scenario was possible, and you said that the regulation is locked. It's been locked for 20 years now. Yet, what I would like to add to what has been said is that we lack resources. We cannot speak about school and integration if we do not have financial resources. We have raised the assessments, performed by CAT, which are mm, non-suitable mm, as a result of the lack of financial resources and the lack of participation of the mm, regulation. So thanks, thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure listening to you. I felt, I mean, I have resonated a lot in what has been said. I'm Carmen Camacho from Belvice Workshops. Thank you very much to all of you for your remarks. Now, when it comes to the inclusive school debate, while preparing the session with our friend, you gave me an interesting example that was quite striking to me. In neighboring countries like Portugal and Spain, I don't know if I really understood it here, but it seems like there they closed the special education schools. I would like to ask you if this is the case and how they managed, because it's a very interesting practical example. And of course, if we compare, right, at home, we have a case of people living with disabilities. And of course, there are different uh, degrees of disability. It seems difficult, but maybe it's only out this clear lack of resources, right? It's very difficult to foresee the continuity of certain people living with disabilities, especially when we speak about severe disabilities. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about these two examples, which will be extremely thought-provoking and uh, positive. Awareness raising. Sometimes it's not all about money. I think that parents and the school play a very important role. Let me give you an example. I used to be against the use of mobile phones at class. Now she's 19 years old and it's too late. So even parents, when I used to say, listen, we should not use telephones in the school, and other parents used to say, yeah, 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 why not? And now it seems like 
I've been proven right. També es deia que molt bé, molt bé, i jo sé que moltes, perquè a casa nosaltres estava en contra de segons quins programes, perquè no és bo. Not to speak about certain TV programs. Children are like sponges. Ja podíem veure segons quins coses que entraven allà a la classe. Vull dir amb això, que si no utilitzem... Watching certain TV programs can be extremely harmful for children, so unless we approach things from a bottom-up perspective, things will go wrong. So if the regular school invests resources only in training, and if the rest of people are not mm, sensitive, uh, nothing will be possible. Not everything is limited to money. Comencem amb el tema educatiu, jo amb el tema que deies de recursos. Abans d'ahir vaig estar justament amb la persona del síndic de Greuges, que va fer un informe fa uns quants anys. The sound is insufficient. Apologies, we'll be back as soon as the sound is back. I can't, we cannot follow. Que recursos em falten, però n'hi ha que no s'utilitzen. M'explico. N'hi ha que hi són per ser-hi, per fer informe per fer no sé quantes coses, però no per estar en el net. Parlant dels EAP, València. Van agafar els EAP i van dir, no, no, la feina és a l'escola ordinària, a l'institut. I aneu? Es va liar. Però hi són. On fan falta els recursos? A l'escola ordinària. I n'hi ha, en falten també. Però si els posem en solfa i algú els dirigeix, que això és el que costa més, algú supervisa, sense altres motivacions que la del nen i la del mestre, doncs jo penso que n'hi ha, evidentment, amb actituds positives i tot el tema, evidentment, amb una comunitat mentalitzada. Faig un salt a la teva pregunta. És a dir, hi ha quatre exemples que són els que estan analitzant. És Portugal, és Itàlia, és Newham, que és un barri de Londres, i és, evidentment, New Brunswick a Canadà, que són els quatre fars, és a dir, escolta, si ens hi posem políticament, segurament que aconseguirem que aquesta escola que tots volem. Me'n vaig a Itàlia. A Itàlia què va passar? Anys 70. Ho explicava abans aquest dematí. La gent va descobrir que hi havia llocs, hi havia espais, manicomis, escoles especials que es maltractaven. I va ser la societat que es va aixecar els anys 70 per dir, ei, això s'ha de tancar. Hem d'obrir finestres i aquests gens han d'estar on està tothom. Em sembla que hi ha un 1% d'escoles especials. Portugal, projecte polític. Ei, a 10 anys o a 8 anys, som aquí, volem arribar fins aquí. Estratègies, hem dit. A poc a poc, anem avançant. Han arribat a tancar pràcticament el 80% d'escoles especials. Els recursos on són? L'escola ordinària. Niu amb projecte polític, també. És a dir, voluntat política de dir, ei, això és un dret. L'escola ordinària és un dret per tots els alumnes. Pla de treball a 8 anys. Tenim 10 escoles especials. Les tancarem totes? No ho sé. Anem avançant. Van tancar... The interpreters again. Apologies, the sound is insufficient. No ens enganyem. Algunes hi han de ser. Per on? Per alumnes potser d'unes edats ja més avançades, per alumnes amb greus problemes de comportament i de salut mental, és molt delicat. Això sí que realment pot distorsionar molt, però la resta no. Jo he estat col·laborant a Niuga, amb Anglaterra, i has vist a les aules, i secundària també, alumnes amb gravíssimes discapacitats a l'aula. Ara bé, amb suports i tant, amb suport, però ben orquestrats. Un dels elements que diuen que funciona molt bé, i es pot aconseguir, és que sempre hi hagi dos professionals a l'aula. I tu recordaràs una escola que es diu Xiprés, que van aconseguir la pròpia escola que sempre hi hagués dos professionals a l'aula. Un mestre i l'altre no calia hi hagués una persona de pràctiques, que hi hagués un vetllador, i llavors això et dona moltes garanties per tirar endavant. I remarco el que deia de la Convenció de Drets, és a dir, el dret és de l'alumne. Si aquest alumne comença de ben petit a escoles bressol, 
de molt petit a Escola Ressol és que els nens no veuen cap discapacitat. És que no la veuen, la discapacitat. És que dius, si el problema és nostre, no és dels nens. Si un nen s'acostuma, viu i conviu amb nens que no veuen altra cosa, segurament ens en sort que quan arribem a la vida adulta el pot fer gran capaç ja ens el farà. Perquè hi haurà segurament com un 10% too far from the microphone and unfortunately we cannot hear him. So I agree with you today there is a regulation and a portfolio of services which is very much oriented towards institutions depending on your dependency degree. You have certain rights but not others and this is why I talked about the future orientation. We need to set up strategies to personalize support mechanisms que estableixen en pressupostos personals. Ahir em passava en un informe que a mi em sembla meravellós, en què ha participat la Clara Clos, que coneixereu molts de vosaltres, de Pere Mitjans, pel tema dels habitatges per persones amb trastorns de conducta, no? I jo fa anys que ho estic dient. Volem fer innovació metodològica. So we want to innovate, but whether we want to innovate tecnològically, pedagògically, and for this we will need a additional budget. In my entity, I've said there will be no innovation or research unless we have an asset, a blocked asset to invest to projects of this nature. It's just impossible. If we invest all the resources to emergencies, right, and to everyday life basic needs, so there is a clear lack of political will, and this is why. I mentioned it, right? No te dreta una vida independent perquè els recursos van adreçats i van predeterminats en funció de qui ets. Resources often times are marked and this is a clear lack of compliance with the convention. In Nordic countries, during the 60s and the 70s, they attained very high integration rates because they started working on education, because of course this double line perpetuates segregation in adult life. In 24 years I've met many people that interpreters again the sound is making our life impossible the, 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 there are permanent interruptions in the sound and as a result of that it becomes impossible to offer a more or less reasonable service apologies again i said that if to people with disability go to the ordinary school as I did, you see that you're normal. What I don't think it's normal is to separate. At work, I'm like my co-workers, I'm not a person with a disability, no. I'm Sergi, and if we normalize people with disabilities at school, at uh, the workplace, and we put the person with disability at the center, this, this person with disability would see himself or herself as someone normal, and the others too. When I went to the university, the people I met, saw me as someone normal. Well, there are people of different sorts, but um, other people did not have the problem of seeing me as someone weird or different. So the person had to be at the center and we won't have this problem of seeing yourself different from the rest or the other one seeing you in a different way. 
Bueno, no sé si se mantes, porque tú eres friend, you were saying it's the right of the child, not the right of the family. And the family know very well that we represent uh, the children because sometimes they don't know how to represent themselves. But I, for me, it's crystal clear that the family have no rights in that sense. It was the children. The convention left it very clear. The convention says it very clear. It talks about the right of the child because the child will see that it has a place uh, in society. I have a sister, uh, Marseille, with a disability. She's 57 and she loves a sparkling wine, Cava. I think that we should call it today. Thank you very much to the presenters of the morning, the presenters of the afternoon, evening. In the morning, we looked at the past. We saw examples of memorialization that uh, serve to recognize and sometimes to compensate the crime from the past. But the looking at the past has taken us to talk about the present situation. Thank you very much to all the, our audience for their questions and remarks. Thanks to the panelists. And uh, we hope to see you in the next edition of the seminar. Thank you. Thank you.